Der Vatikan, Machtzentrum der römisch-katholischen Kirche, gilt als konservativ. Dass seine Vertreter ein Problem haben mit Männern, die Männer lieben, ist bekannt. Doch ausgerechnet der Vatikan soll eine der größten homosexuellen Communities der Welt beherbergen. Das behauptet mein heutiger Gast, der französische Soziologe und Journalist Frédéric Martel. Er sitzt in Paris fest, ich hier in Zürich. Deshalb führen wir das Interview per Skype. Good afternoon, Frédéric Martel. How are you? Yes, exactly. We don't, we don't see anyone, so, so you know, I, I would like to thank you to speak with me. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I'm totally lonely. Yeah, we are happy no, that you're with us. You know, there is a lot of work to do, so we are going to survive. I don't know if it's going to work one month, but for a few days, it's, it's good. We will see. So, coming uh, to the topic, we are, uh, wanted to, um, yeah, talk about today, you allege that the Vatican prelates, bishops and cardinals are on the one hand gay and on the other, other hand they fiercely reject homosexuality. This sounds like a dramatic, yeah, scenario, isn't it? Yes and, and no. Um, if, you, if you come back to, to the tradition, if you come back to the past, it, in fact it's pretty... Uh, pretty um, coherent. And a lot of people said to me, you know, that's totally uh, unbelievable that they are both gay and homophobic. In fact, if you read Proust, if you read André Gide, Rimbaud, and many other writers, and I just speak about the French, but we can mm. also discuss Thomas Mann or Visconti and many others in the past. But they were uh, not prelates or bishops, right? <laughs> no, but that's the same... Uh, psychological system you uh, you are very homophobic when you are yourself either gay or what I call homophile mm. an homophile is a mm. gay that is not acting uh, and when you're afraid that your homosexuality become public so that's a very traditional way of acting and to understand the Vatican and at large uh, the church you need to 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 understand that we are not in the Vatican with people that live in 2020. To some extent, they still live in 1950 or 1960. A lot of them, and I met, I interviewed many of them that are 90, 91, 94 years old. Mm -hmm. So you are with people that have been 20 years old in the 1940s or 50s. So it means Uh, they react, they, they think, they, they basically they have built their uh, opinion on homosexuality 70 or 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's explained everything. This is why I'm not against them. I'm not criticizing them. I try to understand their, their way of being. And it's a question of time, mainly. Mm, yeah, that's we're coming to that point. But still there lies an explosive power in your hypothesis. You're saying that, uh, no, let's start like that. Men who adhere to their homosexuality um, cannot, according to Roman Catholic uh, doctrine, become priests. And still you say that 80%, or you quote someone who says that, 80% of them are gay. Now I'm asking myself, who is closing their eyes uh, to reality? And why? So first of all, I, I never said, as you as you mentioned, uh, thanks, uh, just um, a, a few seconds ago, I never said myself that 80% of the people in the Vatican or priests are priests. But gay. would you That's say it seems to be the majority? Yes, I mean, I'm not doing a. a quantitative research mm -hmm. because that's mm -hmm. just impossible. Nobody can, you know, even if you interview all of the priests in the mm -hmm. Vatican, they are not going to tell you the truth. So what I'm doing, it's a quantitative, uh, a, sorry, what I'm doing, it's a qualitative research mm -hmm. and not a quantitative one. But once again, uh, the question is not about the numbers and the goal is not to understand is the priest A, the bishops B or Cardinal C is gay or not. And I'm not outing people. I try to understand the system because it has a lot of consequences, especially on sexual abuse, and I will discuss that probably with you later. The main point is that it's a sociological system. When you are homosexual in a little village in Italy in 1950, mm -hmm. or even if you are not sure, 
you're not attracted by women you don't really want to be married you don't you don't have a, uh, you you don't, you don't have an adherence for sex with women and also if you're like in a bourgeois family in a big city like in Milan or Paris or Zurich in the 1950s and you understand there is a problem becoming a priest is a solution you have a people in your school or in the seminary that make joke with you. Um, you might want to, 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 to sing with a kind of very uh, uh, special voice so you can take some clothes uh, that are more feminine and all that makes you in trouble. Even your mother, your mom understand that there is something wrong and she's so happy by this sudden incredible vocation about becoming a priest and becoming a priest all your problems become a strength the weakness mm -hmm. becomes a strength so you live only with men you can sing with the voice you want you can put the clothes you want and basically you don't have to marry and you don't have to, uh, to, 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 to to have a fake relationship with a woman so that's not a question of uh, the people being um, lying or being in a, in a kind of uh, um, totally illegal way of doing things. That's just a sociological uh, utterance. Yes, uh, and yes, the uh, church has recruited, promoted, and accepted to some extent the fact that a large majority of the priests are gay. Well, I get your point. I mean, the, the last part, we have to talk about that. But um, this is 50 years ago. How is it today? And if it's that obvious, you just said, uh, yeah, the church somehow accepts it. I mean, if it's that obvious, why has no one ever written such a book as you did uh, before? This is very, this is some, seems to me very strange. Okay, two, two points. First of all, Uh, on the first question, today I think it's pretty different. First of all, straight people who understand very quickly that, especially if you become a seminarian, and I interview many of them, they, they don't accept this kind of homoerotic atmosphere. Second of all, even the, the gay people, because now it's very different, even in a little village in Italy or in Switzerland, you have other options when you are homosexual. So basically, people don't want to be priests. I mean, that's a fact. And in a way, it's a quantitative fact. 80, um, sorry, 800 priests are basically they, they are dead, die every year in France. I give you only French numbers. Yeah. Less than 60 of priests are now ordinary. So it means in five or ten years, there is no priest at all. Nobody, nobody wants to become a priest anymore. The straight, because okay. they don't accept the <laughs> condition not to be married, and the gay people, because there is other options. Giving now, uh, go, going now to the second point, I, why this book hasn't been written? And I would say it wouldn't have been written ten years ago. It was still too difficult to tell that. But... First of all, so you the, would say it changed because uh, there are more rights for homosexuals, for example, same sex yes. marriage and everything. So that helped you writing this book to, to some extent. Yes. Second of all, there is incredible big scandals about sexual abuse in the church. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, it's about thousands of priests in Australia, in the US, in Ireland, but also in, in, in Brazil, in Mexico, in, in Chile and so on, that have been accused or jailed or condemned because of sexual abuse. So mm -hmm. the fact that the priests have no sexuality, nobody believes that anymore. It's about thousands of people that have been in jail for that or accused. So you're speaking uh, from the... I mean, you're speaking from the outside, but then I'm, again, I'm asking uh, myself, what were the reactions on your book? I mean, you've written it uh, one year ago, a lot of time to react and respond on your book. Also, I asked the uh, Swiss Bishops Conference, they wouldn't provide me with a statement. They say they are busy with the coronavirus at the moment, as everyone <laughs> is. But I mean, what were the reactions also uh, from within the Vatican, from, uh, not from the people you were talking um, with? To why this book hasn't been written so far? Because if you're an Italian uh, journalist, you, uh, you are still in a country where 
that kind of things are difficult with your publisher, with your newspaper. If you are a, what we call a, um, a Vaticanist, you know, this very special journalist that work mainly on the Vatican, you lose your job if you write a book like that. Mm -hmm. And if you are straight, you don't get the code. You don't understand the system. This is why this book has been done today and not 10 years ago by a French uh, journalist that has the code and who is not a Vaticanist. But to answer your question, mm -hmm. you know, the reaction were very mixed. Uh, first of all, nobody, uh, no cardinal basically spoke about the book and they didn't even sue or attack or make any uh, trial uh, with the book. So we are, the book has been published everywhere without any uh, juridical uh, issue. But why the way, didn't they respond? Do you think they, they th just thought this is not important for us. This is all bullshit. Sorry, sorry. Ex excuse my English, but I mean, why didn't they respond? Because I mean, what you're writing here is very explicit. Yes, but again, I mean, by the way, I have 14 lawyers uh, when I wrote my book, so yeah. we, we also took a lot of uh, protections and we knew uh, very well what we were doing. The book has been published published by very big mainstream publisher in Germany, mm. in France, in Italy, in mm. the U.S., among the most famous ones. I mean, in the yeah, U.S. Of course, they want to have the story. No, but I mean, it's a serious book. Bloomsbury is also the publisher of, of Harry Potter. So they don't do, uh, you know, it's not like a, a, a fake book published in a... That's not what I was, was, uh, I was saying. Yeah. I, I'm but, you know, basically... Everybody from from the Vaticanists that I spoke to all the time, mm. and also the, the the cardinal that spoke with me. I I I, I, I interview more than 42, 43 cardinals. I mean, all of them told me the story to some extent. Mm. Everybody knows the story, and you might you might discuss that fact or that page or that what I'm saying about these people, because it's extremely difficult to work on uh, sexuality and especially homosexuality in the Vatican. But, you know, we can discuss one point, but I'm sure 100% about the overall theory. And that's basically what a lot of very famous theologians and people have said. Even the Pope said in an unofficial, unofficial st uh, discussion with a lawyer that has been published everywhere in, in Latin America and in the US, I read the book. That's okay. I knew everything. That's Pope Francis who said that. Well, and basically, you know, for example, for example, I, I don't discuss anymore, to be honest, with many people in the Vatican. Mm. That's normal after a book like that. But, you know, I have a lot of... Uh, you didn't make friends there. No, I, I had, and I'm still uh, seeing the cardinal, the archbishop, the priest, who, who invited me to live inside the Vatican with them. So I still have lunch with them in Rome in a kind of a secret restaurant but, to discuss. And they are still very friendly and happy with me. But that's true that people prefer not to discuss the issue because the, the, the book is basically uh, giving one of the most important secrets of the last four years. Yes, but I mean, your um, assertions are based on private conversations. And how can you be sure that the people who were talking to you were saying the truth? You know, that's, uh, I'm sorry to say, that's the, the the job of a journalist. You know, if somebody tell me about this cardinal being gay, you know, I'm not publishing that. If I would have done that, uh, you know, the Vatican... No, you're be not outing people, but... No. I mean so I try to explain how it works. I try not to, to be against anyone. I mean, I out some people that are dead for a long time or people that have been already known as homosexual by the media or because of a trial mm -hmm. and, and justice, but not living cardinals or bishops. Why? Because my goal is to is not to out anyone. It's to out, in a way, the system, to out uh, the Vatican. But, you know, they are recorded. They knew who I was. I never lie on my name. Nobody, uh, everybody knew I was a journalist, a writer, uh, writing a book about the Vatican. They didn't know all the work I was doing, which is normal. And also when they asked me to be off the record, 
they are of the record. My the rules I applied are very general rules mm -hmm. of any uh, international newspaper. So, so we're coming back to the Pope. You said the Pope knows. Um, you also refer in your investigations um, to the double standards of the Catholic Church and from in, in several sermons, like from 2016 to 2018, uh, Pope Francis denounces exactly what you were saying. We're showing just a quick video of that. State attenti voi, davanti ai rigidi. State attenti davanti ai cristiani siano laici, preti, vescovi, che si presentano così perfetti, rigidi. Sono i rigidi della doppia vita. Si fanno vedere belli, onesti, ma quando nessuno li vede fanno delle cose brutte. La rigidità non è un dono di Dio. Dietro la rigidità C'è sempre qualcosa di nascosto, in tanti casi una doppia vita. So you think Pope Francis really knows what you, um, uh, you have written in this book and he knew it before? You know, I'm not uh, a magician or somebody that is going to describe something based on, uh, um, on uh, hypothesis. If I mention that, it's because I met uh, a lot of close advisors of Pope Francis. Mm. And actually, they are, they are mentioned in my book. Some also are not, because they wanted to stay off the record. And this is what they say. They explain to me how it works. And when you look at the sentences on a regular basis that the Pope are using, mm. the, the code is using, the words he, he, he has against his opponents, he says that extremely clearly. By the way, there is a lot of problems in the Vatican. You have a problem about sexuality, and homosexuality is one of them, but you have also straight people, you have also sexuality with women, you have a problem with money, you have a problem with power and abuse of power, and so on and so forth. And also you have, of course, the sexual abuse that are very different than the normal sexuality. Mm. And, you know, whoever, you know, to... To, to speak to you also, because I know you, you're interested in religion, and I think your listeners are also. You don't have to believe me. You don't even have to read the book or to trust me. But if you don't understand the system next month, and the month after, and the year after, you will be desperate. Yeah, because so again and again, scandals mm. and and the uh, revelations, and the uh, outing, and new gay cardinal. It will be a never-ending story. And yes. this is so, what the Pope knows. Let me ask another question, <laughs> because I want to know more about that. You call homosexuality the main key uh, to understanding the Vatican. And could you explain that even more? I mean, you were starting with that. But in which sense is there a connection between homosexuality? And you even said this VatiLeaks topic or the finances. In which way is homosexuality um, in a in yeah it stands in a relation to that? My focus is homosexuality, and I'm pretty broad on looking at the issue because I discuss also money. The link with the extreme mm. right, the, the function of the uh, the Vatican in many other aspects. But yes, I think homosexuality is one of the key of explanation. Not again, I don't have any problem with a bishop or a cardinal being gay. I mean, if they have a lover, if they have sex, I I don't care. I mean, for me, it should be allowed. The only problem is if. It's underage, if it's about prostitution or if it's about abuse and without consent. That's it. And also in the Vatican, there is a specificity of this kind of uh, droit de cuissage, as we say in French, which is a droit du seigneur. When somebody, because he has power, is a bishop or is a nuncio, can ask sexual favor to a seminarian or a priest that is without any power. So, so that means... The only concern for me. The other things I don't mind and I don't care. And I'm, That's... I, to be honest, I prefer a priest or a bishop with a boyfriend than a priest that will touch a kid of 10 years old. Mm. That's it. 
Yes, but my question was, in which sense are these uh, topics intertwined? So you also say that um, it is a, homosexuality in a certain sense is a key factor when it comes to the widely known scandals of the Catholic Church. You just also uh, said that. But is then the sex abuse scandal in your eyes also a, a gay scandal? Or in which sense do we have to understand that and also differentiate that so that not homosexuality and pedophilia are um, mixed, right? Because that would be the, the yeah, danger. Yes, I mean, you, you, you very, your, your question is very good and you're, you're very right here. Um, the, the problem is the problem of the culture of secrecy. When you have a system, an organization that is based on a lie, and actually you might not agree with me and you might not like me for saying that, but I Don't think worry. the Vatican is mainly an organization of lies. Everything is about lie. You lie about money, you lie about the, the organization, you lie about the power, and you lie, lie about sexuality, whatever the sexuality is. So when you have a culture of secrecy and of lie so big, then you can have people that have a sexuality that's totally uh, forbidden, like sexual abuse, that are also protected by this culture of life. And I think that's the issue. The problem is not homosexuality. Homosexuality, we know that by many studies, have, has no link with sexual abuse. The sexual abuse in the world, in general, are mainly in the family or in schools, and the victims are mainly girls. And therefore heterosexual. And, yes, and it's mainly heterosexual everywhere in the world. However, in the church, we also know that the victims by priests are between 80 to 85 percent, depending on the studies, men or boys. So there is a specificity in the Catholic Church that make a link between this attraction for boys and uh, sexual abuse. Why is that? That's not homosexuality the problem. The problem is when you don't assume your desire, when you lie about your homosexuality or even your sexuality to others, but also to yourself. When you are so um, repressed, so in, in, in a strategy of hiding and not even accepting what you are, this is why, what you do when you want to have sex. You go to kids, you go to migrants, and you go to priests or seminarians because you have an authority uh, to them, and they are not going to speak. That's as simple as that. You try to have sex with people that are not going to speak. Of course, you don't go to a gay bar and to say, hey, I'm a cardinal or I'm a bishop and I'm interested by you. You need to have strategy of cover-up. And that's the reason why the system as at large is a system that protects sexual abuse, even though, and I insist on that, even though the goal of the pope or the bishop or the cardinal is not, of course, to protect uh, the sexual abuser. The problem is you protect them because you cannot discuss the overall lie. But then the problem would solve itself in a few decades when uh, the society is more and more in favor of um, rights for homosexuals, isn't it? Yes, and that's also the big problem. You know, before the, let's say, the 70s, you know, 1968, the 70s, the church, you know, was basically against gay people, but the society at large was also, homosexuality was forbidden, sometimes criminalized, and so basically the church was not singular at all. The problem is when the, the society became much more gay friendly, and especially in the 90s, but even from the 80s on, then the church has to be even more homophobic to, to, to hide uh, the secret. It's always a very complex system where you have homosexuality, all of them are homosexual. You have also uh, money that plays a very key role, especially Marshall Maciel, Karadima, or Grower, or Makarik in the US. You have also ideology. A lot of them were extremely right-wing uh, bishops or priests that were uh, both giving a lot of money to the Vatican, but also fighting against theology of liberation or communism in Latin America. And because of that, they were protected by John Paul II and even by uh, mm. Pope Benedict XVI. But, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you in that, but I'm, I'm um, asking myself if with this book, uh, 
the way it is written, also with some gloating details and everything, if you really reach the true believers, which would be uh, important to uh, reach, actually, and you yourself are not a believer, you write in your book, um, you believe more in literature than in religion, you write. So do you really think you can reach them? Or was this even one of your ideas to reach them? You know, I get uh, every day 10 letters um, by mainly by priests, by Catholics, by former priests, former Catholics, that tells me their, their, their life. And it's they discover basically the system in my book, and, and they, they are shocked because they say, oh, that was my impression. Oh, that was the reason why I stopped to be a priest. Mm. Oh, I've been abused by this priest, and so on and so forth. And I, I don't want to make my own publicity, but the book has been number one bestsellers in France. Yeah, it was a world bestseller. In more than 15 countries. Yeah. Uh, we, we sold probably more than 600, a bit less, a bit more, we don't know exactly, 1,000, 600,000 copies around the world. So the reaction was was by the people themselves. What we call in, in French, we say, parce que c'est concernant. It means because it concerned them, because that's about their life. And so, you know, at the same time, when you're a writer, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, I'm also not Catholic, I'm also openly gay, so I'm very transparent. But you're a former Catholic, yeah. right? Sorry? Yes, I've been Catholic until age 10, yeah. you know, like everybody in France. Yeah. But I'm a cultural Catholic, probably. Mm. I mean, I, I grew up in Catholicism, mm. like, like everybody in this country, and I'm proud of that. I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of, you know, I like uh, Rimbaud and I like uh, uh, Verlaine, I like uh, uh, Rembrandt and uh, Leonardo Vinci. They, they were also Catholic and Michelangelo. But, uh, but of course, I'm, I'm a pure secular uh, person in France and, and LGBT uh, uh, friendly and openly gay, as I said. But I'm a researcher. I'm doing things that are, I think, serious. And but, yes, uh, but my goal, the goal of a writer, I, I'm not a judge. I'm not judging them. No. I don't want to. I don't want to change the church because that's not my job. My job is to explain and to describe a system, and then people can can act if they want. But that's not. I don't have a political agenda. Yeah, but still, you have been accused of confusing your research with your personal activism um, for gay rights. That was one uh, point which people thought could be a problem. Yes, but that's fake. I mean, you can say that of uh, Solzhenitsyn and you can have said that of André Gide mm, when he criticized mm. communism. You know, if you know me and if you have read what I've wrote, I was, I was for a long time one of very uh, hard critics. I criticized the gay community a lot, especially in the AIDS epidemic. I wrote several books that are also criticized of my own people. So, you know, I expect from Catholics to do the same, to criticize also their own people. You know, when you read my book, and especially the end of the book, nobody can say that I'm against Catholic people or against priests. No, that's and not what I meant, yeah. Yeah, that's it. And of course, you know, when you write a book like that, you know three things in the beginning. First of all, you are going to be attacked. Second of all, you cannot say everything you know. Mm. And third of all, you cannot even understand everything. Mm. That's so crazy. This world is so amazing. This world is so uh, give, uh, organized with fake news and, and lie and, and untruth uh, information that it's very difficult to understand many aspects of the book. This is why, for example, I never discussed the, the death of John Paul I or the assassination of Swiss Guard inside the Vatican, because at the end, I don't know. Books and articles have been written on that, but I don't want to go on this subject because I don't have proof. Yeah. When I write something, it's because I'm 100% sure. And the book is not based on rumors or innuendo. It's based only on fact, on police documents. Thank you for on... that clarification, Frédéric. Yes, and also about tons. And I create on the website a document of more than 300 pages on sources, documents. We, uh, unfortunately... Uh, testimony and so on. People can look that up. Unfortunately, our talk is already over. I thank you a lot for the clarification on our Skype talk and all the best to you. Thanks a lot.